there's a lot of buzz lately about a diabetic drug called semiglutide, and a lot of people are trying to use this as an attempt to lose body fat. In today's show, we're going to talk more about what semiglutide is, how it works, and whether or not you should consider semiglutide if you're trying to lose weight, and most importantly, are there other natural ways to mimic what semiglutide does without the potential downside? So let's dive into what is semiglutide. It's a GLP-1 agonist. Essentially, what that means is it's a synthetic way to agonize the GLP-1 receptor. You're saying, okay, well, what is GLP-1? Glucagon-like peptide 1, there's two forms of this, GLP-1 and GLP-2. There's also a related hormone called GIP, GIP-1, or GIP. And these hormones are all function under the category of gastrointestinal increase in hormones. This is a category of hormones that helps you in the post-meal window process the foods that you eat in the post-meal window. That, that includes, but it is not limited to, improving insulin sensitivity, uh, decreasing glucagon, uh, all of the different post-meal processing that occurs after you eat to maintain homeostasis in the body. And it turns out an early phenotypic future of insulin resistance is a loss in the function of these gastrointestinal increase in hormones. In fact, a large attribution of bariatric surgery is linked to a sort of a, a, a over amplification in the release of these hormones. Many people think when you get bariatric surgery, well, that causes weight loss because it's restricting the quantity of the foods that you eat, which in fact is not the case. In fact, about 80% of the mechanism, so to speak, of bariatric surgery is by powerfully amplifying, and I'm not promoting the surgery necessarily here, but just understand the mechanisms, is by amplifying the release of these increasing hormones. And that's why GLP-1 activators or agonists and also DPP-4 inhibitors. DPP-4 is the enzyme that breaks down GLP-1. That's been used pharmacologically for the treatment of diabetes and weight loss for a long time. That's why they're so popular as a means to impact diabetes trajectory. And so a few Hollywood celebrities, as I understand it, have been using this uh, for weight loss. And there was actually a paper right here in the New England Journal of Medicine titled, Once Weekly Semiglutide in Adults with Overweight or Obesity. And this was a 68-week study. So this was a you know year and some change. And what they found is comparing body weight in a control group, placebo group, that didn't get semiglutide compared to the intervention group, they did lose about 14% body weight. Now, the study didn't stratify for body mass changes or, or how much fat mass is lost and, and lean mass is preserved. But it was quite significant, about a 14% change in body weight compared to control in the group that used the GLP-1 agonist here, which is semiglutide. So you might be thinking, well, oh my gosh, I need to get on this drug, right? Like this is a miracle drug. Well, not so fast because what semiglutide can do, one of the downsides here is it does exert a little stress on the pancreatic beta cells. And so there is some research showing an increased prevalence of pancreatitis and potentially pancreatic cancer because you are stimulating the pancreas by giving, you know, super physiologic levels uh, and ag agonizing the GLP-1 receptor. So thankfully, there's a lot of natural ways to go about this first without taking a drug, particularly if you don't have type 2 diabetes or you're not insulin dependent and you're not morbidly obese. Before we continue on, friends, I just want to say thank you for being here. If you're enjoying the content, please hit that like button, leave a comment below. And if you find this video helpful, I would be honored if you could share this with a friend because we're talking about hormones and gut hormones. I just want to create a small plug. Uh, this is an old book that I wrote in 2012, but we have two chapters dedicated to the gut hormones. This is called The Belly Fat Effect. And so this is not a new concept. I'm glad that Hollywood celebrities and, and the media are promoting this drug, semiglutide, insofar as it creates more awareness about the powerful effect that gut health has on overall metabolism and body composition. So if you want to learn strategies to improve naturally the release of, of gut hormones, these increasing hormones, this book is available for you. Again, it's very, it's old, but it's very current and relevant to what's going on with regards to how people are reframing how they view weight loss. Because as I mentioned, a lot of people don't realize that bariatric surgery, how it's effective at inducing rapid weight loss is by powerfully increasing these gut hormones. And thankfully, there's many natural ways that we can increase these gut hormones. And I want to share with you some images now from a paper titled Recent Updates on GLP-1 Agonists, Current Advances and Challenges. So I'll just read to you verbatim what they said so you have a better idea, even though we are, we've already talked about this. Um, one hormone called GIP, known as gastrointestinal peptide, and glucagon-like peptides are two incretins that are released upon ingestion of food in a biphasic manner to overcome postprandial hyperglycemia by increasing insulin secretion from the pancreatic beta cell. Now, that, that's important because remember, 
part of the reason why people get hyperglycemic and insulin resistance is because not only is there a down regulation of the sensitivity of insulin at the receptor level, but that they don't sometimes release enough insulin in the postprandial meal as diabetes progresses or insulin resistance progresses. And so these hormones help to sensitize the pancreatic beta cell in addition to other things. Now, that's why I'm not a fan of necessarily using this medication for people that just want to lose weight because there's many other more natural ways without the potential downsides. They go on to say that um, these incretin hormones also prevent post-meal glucose excursions. So we know glycemic variability is a problem. You don't want to have massive ebbs and flows in your blood glucose. You want to have a more stable, a more even level. And that's why walking after meals, for example, that's why not having big bolus meals of carbohydrates and so forth is helpful. And they say the diminished activity of both GIP and GLP-1 has been observed as one of the pathologic futures of type 2 diabetes along with beta cell insulin resistance and obesity. And here's an image that will help you uh, better understand all the different gut hormones. We talk about this extensively in the book, Belly Fat Effect. And I mentioned the DPP4 enzyme. That has been used for a long time because that is also degrading uh, GIP, gastrointestinal peptide, and also GLP-1. But these gut-derived peptides, these incretins, are released or they should be released from the gut after you eat. Now, again, a lot of people are mindlessly eating. They're you know, not chewing their food and eating food when they're on Instagram or when they're in the car. They're eating food that is devoid of polyphenolic compounds. They're eating refined foods. That is a recipe to, to sort of uh, squash or prevent the, the normal increase in these health-promoting gastrointestinal and cretin hormones, as is featured here. But they, they function throughout the body. They go to the heart, they go to muscle, they go to the brain, they influence appetite and satiety. And that might be why pharmacologic administration of semaglutide and other GLP-1 agonists is, is associated with weight loss and improvements in, in other metabolic parameters. But for those of you that are interested in natural ways to mimic what this drug can do, there are some compounds that we're going to talk about, such as exercise. Exercise is one of the best ways to increase the release of these gastrointestinal and cretin hormones. That's why, for example, when you exercise, you're generally not very hungry right after you exercise. It's because exercise increases these hormones. Um, another compound that's natural that we've talked a lot about is berberine. Berberine, in fact, one of the main mechanisms of action is purported to be increasing levels of these gut hormones and also changing the microbiome. And I want to talk about probiotics in a moment. But understand that these gastrointestinal hormones, GLP-1 and GIP and GLP-2, they have an inside-out effect in terms of controlling the ecosystem of your gut microbiome. And so they've been shown to improve the uh, immunologic function within the, the immune cells uh, that, that comprise and are, are you know, um, sort of adjacent in your uh, epithelial cells in the gut. So they do impact the composition of the microbiome, the diversity of the microbiome. So there is some correlation there. And that's also why probiotics, specifically bifidobacterium, have been shown to actually lead to a healthier gastrointestinal incretin response. Now, it's important to recognize that in these videos, I just want to mention that we can't diagnose, cure, treat, or prevent any diseases. We're talking about optimizing health, in this case, gut health, because part of gut health is a healthy incretin response. Remember, the incretin hormones help you in the post-meal window become more metabolically flexible, and that's the important point. So probiotics, as I mentioned, particularly bifidobacterium, is another thing to consider. If you're getting excited about semiglutide, you're like, I, I want to go and take this drug sort of off-label, and even though I don't have diabetes, I want to lose some fat. Well, okay, fine, but please exhaust these natural solutions first because they do not have the downsides linked with pancreatitis and sort of whipping the pancreas to secrete more insulin. Uh, another thing that a lot of people don't recognize is both GABA and L-glycine have been shown to increase GLP-1, at least in animal models. And so... Well, how, you might be thinking, well, how does GABA, how does glycine help do that? Well, it turns out that when we're in a parasympathetic state, there is a greater postprandial increase in the gut hormones, again, GLP-1 and, and GIP. And that might be why it's important to, after you eat, you know, be grateful, be calm, chew your food. You know, scientists have enumerated how many chews you need. It's about 42 bites per swallow. So instead of just wolfing down food, instead of being on Instagram or social media or watching television, Eat with people you care about, your friends and family. Be grateful for the meal that you have provided for you. Uh, have a com stimulating conversation. Eat slowly. Uh, all those things. Do a little breath work before you eat. All, all of that can be helpful. Um, it turns out that protein, as well as fat, can actually increase the levels 
of these gut hormones. So having adequate protein with, with meals, maybe some avocado, some grass-fed butter or ghee, uh, egg yolks, fattier uh, cuts of meat if you're going to have a higher protein diet. These are all ways to improve satiety. You might be wondering why you don't feel the urge to snack after you eat a protein fat rich meal. Part of that satiety is not just from the macros necessarily, but how the macros interact with the gut and increase levels of these incretin hormones that have satiety signals within your brain. So that's really important. And last but certainly not least, the polyphenolic compounds, the anthocyanidins and proanthocyanidins in blueberries, the hydroxytyrosol in olives and olive oil, um, the catechins in tea, all of these compounds have been shown to be helpful in stimulating the release and the not only the release of the gastrointestinal hormones, but also the diversity and ecology of your microbiome. So I know a lot of people are on a zero carb diet. It's carnivore month. January is carnivore for a lot of people. Hey, that's fine. But I don't think a lot of people are, are suffering deleteriously from having a little bit of blueberries periodically or green tea catechins or even, you know, having the, the olives or olive oil. You know, these compounds have been shown to be helpful in numerous studies and they are not high in lectins and anti-nutrients that lead to worsening of chronic inflammation. So I think it's important to recognize that color and diversity of foods in the diet is helpful uh, insofar as supporting the diversity of the microbiome, but also helping to release these gastrointestinal peptides like GLP-1. So um, what are my thoughts on people taking this? Well, clearly if you're, if you're morbidly obese and you don't exercise and and so forth. I'm all about better life through chemistry. If this is a tool that can help you get a small win, that can help alleviate some of the excess body fat and then alleviate some of the associated joint pain, look, I'm all about a little small win, but I don't think this is something that you should do perpetuity because what happens when you take the GLP-1 agonist away? Could that receptor be desensitized? No one really knows what the long-term effects of this are. And do you want to be on an exogenous agonist for the rest of your life. I, I don't know the cost of this medication, but I certainly don't expect it to be very affordable. Um, and so my two cents here is exhaust the natural solutions first and then consider something like this. Many of the people, I've had friends and family reach out like, hey, I have a coworker who's obese that's taking this. What do you think? And so forth. Um, I, I really think we should, again, exhaust exercise, sleep, stress reduction, mindful eating, make sure you're adequately chewing your food and you're not being distracted by tech when you're eating are, are, are areas that we should totally exploit before even considering this compound. So those are my thoughts. Maybe they would be deemed controversial uh, because we, we do know that obesity and morbid obesity is linked with all sorts of health challenges. Um, so if you're in that category, maybe consider this as a, a short-term solution, but keep doubling down on those other lifestyle strategies as well. I'd love to know your thoughts in the comments. If you've benefited from taking semaglutide or if you have any friends or family that are on it, what they've noticed, let us know in the comments below. As always, appreciate you hitting that like button, sharing this video, and we'll catch you on a future one down the road.